Wisdom is drawn down. What does it mean wisdom is drawn down? So what does exile mean, right? So exile, how do you define exile? So there is external exile. There's exile that happens in the world outside of us. Okay, but then there's an internal exile. And the internal exile, I think I alluded to it in the last, I can't remember what today's day is and what yesterday was, but over the last couple of days, we alluded to this concept. And that is that exile, there's also an internal exile. And one way of defining exile is that the flow does not flow from the mind to the heart. In other words, when am I in exile? Let's say I understand that something should be done. I should do this. I should take this action. I should, I should, uh, I should run the marathon, whatever it should be. That's an action. That's something that I understand in my mind. So if I'm free, that would mean the flow from the mind goes straight to the heart and I feel this way, and then the heart motivates me to take action. That is, uh, that is the healthy, that's the healthy spiritual makeup of a person. Mind to heart to action. What does exile mean? It means in some sense I'm trapped in my, um, it, I'm, I'm trapped by some oppressor, and again, the bigger, biggest oppressor is not the, is not the external oppressor, the biggest oppressor is the internal oppressor. So according to the Kabbalah, the concept of Egypt is that there is a strait that does not allow, there's a narrow space that does not allow the flow from the mind to enter the heart. And they talk about it even if you look at the human body. So again, we mentioned yesterday that the word Mitzrayim, um, um, Egypt means limitation or straits or narrow places. So they say in the human mind, the narrowest part of the body is the neck. So you have the head, the head is wider than the neck. And then you have the torso, which is certainly wider. So a neck represents a narrow place. What does it mean it's a narrow place? It means that there is a difficulty and a challenge. Not everything that you understand in your mind will directly flow to the heart and motivate the heart and then motivate action. There is a process that has to take place. And sometimes there's a difficult process and sometimes there's some blockage that does not allow from, for the mind to flow into the heart. That is what the Kabbalah says. So what's the night of Passover? So the night of Passover, the moichin, what they call, moichin is Hebrew for intelligence. In other words, the, 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 the intellectual awareness flows directly from the mind to the heart without any limitation, without any um, interference. And that is the spiritual definition of redemption from the Kabbalistic perspective. And they talk about how there's all different types of, of, of intellectual awareness. Is what they call chachma, bina, wisdom and understanding. And one is related to humility and one's related to, uh, to uh, understanding and experiencing and getting pleasure from the wisdom. And they connect it to the four cups of wine, the, the three matzot and the four cups of wine. Matzah is one type of awareness and wine is the joy. Wine elicits joy, the Talmud says. So the wine is another form of awareness that, hi, Cherish is coming to join the class. Um, a wine is another form of awareness that, um, that, 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 that is produced by the redemption. So in that sense, that, that, is, that is the Kabbalistic interpretation of the, of the, of the uh, concept of matzah, uh, of the concept of matzah, and in the language of the Kabbalah, when you eat your matzah, what you're doing is you're internalizing moichin, you're internalizing um, awareness, and that will allow for you to achieve spiritual freedom, which means that things that you understand will be able to easily flow into your heart and motivate action. That's the story from the Kabbalistic perspective. And eating the matzah um, allows for this to happen. So that's the Kabbalistic, the Kabbalistic interpretation in, in, uh, in uh, I guess, the way I understand it. That's, that's the way I understand it, at least. Okay, now we're going to move on. Before we get to the Hasidic interpretation, we're going to go to the more practical interpretation from the book that I mentioned earlier, the book of the Chinuch, the book of education. And the book of the education, does, he doesn't really say it specifically. Excuse me, just one moment. Okay, thank you. I apologize. Okay, 
Uh, that's the problem when the kids aren't in school. <laughs> Okay, in any case, so we'll go to the perspective of the book of education. The book of education, oh, very good. The, the girl comes for some education as soon as we start talking about the book of education. Very good. So education, the book of education says something more practical. And he says, look, if you're gonna fulfill the mitzvah of Passover, if you're gonna tell the story, specifically he talks about this in the context of telling the story, not so much about eating of the matzah, but the context of telling of the story. So what happens if you're actually going to, you're going to live in a culture that every, every year we get together and we tell the story of Passover. So what happens to your perspective? So he says it's a very important perspective. Why is it so important? Because you will internalize the concept of what, what they call it, what the, early, what the early philosophers would refer to as chidush ha'aylam. Chidush ha'aylam would mean that the world has been created from new. Without getting into all the philosophical uh, um, back and forth, the early philosophers had this big debate. The big debate would want to know whether or not the world or the, there was material that always existed. And Judaism uh, was unequivocal that the created world, the created universe, or the physical universe has been created from new, something from nothing, ex nihilo. That's why the second word of the Torah We'll probably talk about it this Sunday in our Sunday class. But the second word of the Torah is bara, created. And Nachmanides elaborates and, and tells us that the word created in Hebrew means, has only one definition. That word has only one definition. In Hebrew, there is another word to describe what we refer to as creative. Oh, he's so creative. Oh, she's so creative. That's a different word. That's yitzirati. That's to form. But to create according to um, biblical Hebrew, the word create means something from nothing. So the concept of creation is something from nothing, which means there was a time that there was no physical matter, and physical matter appears somehow, creation, but it wasn't always there. And that's what Judaism held. Now, all the, all, virtually everybody else felt, um, including Aristotle, that no, there was some material that always existed, and the job of the God, the first mover, is to start the process of the evolution of this spiritual, of this physical material, and that ultimately it evolves to what we know today as the known universe. And Judaism is unequivocal that no, that there has to, there is a, there is a point of chidush, there's a point of newness where God makes something from nothing. Why this is so important, I'll talk about in a moment. But it's just interesting to note that from the perspective of modern science, who, who won this debate, okay? So the debate, the debate has not been settled fully yet, but the Big Bang Theory is much closer to what Judaism says than to what the ancient philosophers felt, because the Big Bang Theory tells you that there's a beginning. And what precedes the beginning? Well, we're not sure, nobody knows, right? If you took the Big Bang Theory to Aristotle, he would tell you no, he'd tell you there's something that always, there has to be something that always existed. And all what happens within the known universe is that it evolves or it changes or it forms, whatever the, however you describe it. So it's just interesting to note that this, um, um, the world, the science has moved much closer to what Judaism has been, has been saying. Now, why is this so important from the perspective of Judaism? Is because if you believe that the world always existed, then nature is supreme. If you believe the world has been created, then nature is subject to the creator, right? So if you believe that there is matter always existed, then all the God, quote unquote, could do is manipulate the matter based on the properties that are already, that are embedded within the matter, but it can't create something new. But if God creates it from nothing, so God is in complete control and therefore anything could happen, and the world is not limited by its own definitions. So what is that? Without getting into too much of the philosophy, let's make this a little bit practical. How would that, how, what would the implication be to me sitting here today? So sitting here today, I look at myself and I look at my nature. And I say, my nature is such and such, for whatever reason, because of my upbringing, because of my environment, because of my genetics, whatever the case is, my nature is that I am a person who uh, is angry. Okay, that's my nature. Now, if I come from the perspective, if I come from the point of view that nature rules supreme, then I'm not gonna try to change. Why would I try to improve, right? This is, this is who I am. 
right? One of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite, uh, favorite uh, stories is the guy who loses his temper every day and he breaks the glass every day. Finally, his friend tells him go to the, go to the psychologist. He goes to go go to the shrink. He goes to the shrink, comes back. He says the shrink. He says you changed my life. So the friend says, what happened? You don't get angry anymore. He says, no, 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 I still get angry. So the friend says, what happened? You don't shatter glass when you get home and you're angry? He says, no, 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 I shattered the glass. She says, so what happened? He says, now I don't feel guilty about it. Oh, I ruined the joke. I should have mentioned at the beginning that the problem was, was the guilt. In any case, what am I saying? I'm saying if I'm that person, why would I try to change my nature? It's an impossibility. Best I could do is learn to accept myself, learn to love myself, learn to... Uh, keep throwing the glass or, or at least improving my aim, but I'm not gonna try to change. If I, however, believe that no, the, the, the world, everything within it, it's been created by God, it's new, meaning to say all its properties are um, a, an expression of the divine will, then if the divine will changes, then if God could, then, then, then God is free. If God is free, he's not limited by the properties of the matter, then the human being is free. So in that sense, this is a, not just a philosophical debate, but it's also, it also has practical ramifications of how, what, how do I feel about my own, how do I feel about my own nature? So says the book, just to summarize, and then I'm going to open up the floor before we even get to the Hasidic philosophy. Says, the, says the, the author of the book of education, you're going to get together, gather your children, tell the story of the creation of the world. What you're really telling them is that God can do the unexpected. That's really the story of the Exodus in some form, any way you say it. It's God doing the unexpected. And in that sense, that tells you, that sort of um, solidifies the story of Chidush HaElam, that the world has been created from nothing, and therefore God is capable of performing miracles and changing the, the, the course of nature. And again, the ramification for that is that then I could change myself. So just to summarize what we said till now, Number one, we said the, the Kabbalistic perspective of the eating of the matzah is that there is a sort of built-in um, limitation. There is a built-in, the word I'm looking for is there's a built-in, um, there's a built-in obstacle between what I understand and what I feel. Only a certain measure of what I understand will actually create emotion within my heart and then motivate action. And that is exile. Exile is that I'm trapped because what I, my awareness does, cannot get to where it needs to be. Where it needs to be is my heart. Where it needs to be is my action. And on the night of Passover, Kabbalistically, if I eat the matzah, I'm internalizing this ability of moichin, of intellectual awareness to flow down into my heart and free me of my past um, spiritual and psychological state. This is how you would say it in the words of the Kabbalah. In the words of the book of Chinuch, you would say it a little bit differently. You would say by getting together, telling the story, eating the matzah. And um, this reminds us of the story that the unexpected happens. If the unexpected happens, that tells you about God's imminence in the universe and God creates from nothing. And therefore he's the supreme being and therefore there's no limitation to God. And therefore if God is not limited, then I am not limited. Again, the opposite would be if God is limited, I'm certainly limited. So if God is limited by the matter of the universe that existed and all he can do is manipulate it, so if God has limitations, certainly I'm limited. So that's why these, these concepts, in addition to being intellectual concepts, they also have uh, tremendous practical ramification. So this is the summary of the first two sources that the Tzemach Tzedek quotes before we get to any of the Hasidic interpretation, which we'll maybe get to either today or another time, but in any case, We'll open up the floor if anybody wants to comment. Now is a good time. Let me see if I can figure this out again. Um, here we go. Unmute. Yeah. Okay. Feel free to jump in. Otherwise, you're going to have to hear more from me. You, you, you kind of implied that existence of God in, um, implies more freedom. There is, it's not clear because, you know, God is my owner. God told me to do this, and that. you know what I mean. If there is no God, then I'm responsible. If there is God, uh, well, somebody who created me is responsible. Correct, correct. So we can get into that philosophical discussion that will take us. That's 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 a good. That's a, that's a valid point and a valid discussion of what is God. Uh, my, what's my relationship with God? Does my relationship with God free me or not? That's a valid discussion. But for the purpose of this discussion, let's talk about the God. Let's talk about. Um, 
the perspective of Judaism versus the, the surrounding nations and religions and philosophies. So at that point, everybody believes in God. The question is, what kind of God do you believe in, right? So everybody believes there's an overarching power, an overarching force greater than myself. Everyone believes that. The question is, what's the nature of this power? So ultimately, if, you, if the people who believe that, that, that the world always existed, they say, ultimately, the overarching power is limited. What we're saying is, the overarching power is not limited. If it's not limited, and I could connect to the overarching power, then I'm also not limited. So again, we could open up a discussion about, about, about is having God freeing or not. That's a wonderful discussion. But, but let's, let's, let's go a different, different angle. Let's say we all believe in God. Everyone believes in the God, depending on how you define God. But there's something, there's something, over, there's something greater than self, something that transcends self. And then the question becomes, what's the nature of that overarching power? And if the overarching power is trapped in certain limitations, then who am I? I'm just a speck of dust in the universe, even not even a speck of dust. So I'm certainly trapped in those limitations. So why do I think I can overcome my internal uh, struggles? But if God is free, then I, am, then I could tap into that, that godly spark, then I become free. If I become free, I could free myself. Well, I am free, but my dog is not free. The dog cannot say because my owner is free, I am also free. He has a leash. That's the question of what does God, what, is, what, is, what does God tell you about yourself and about, and about himself? So the, Jew, the Jewish God tells you is because I'm free, you're free too. Now, you're free doesn't mean that, that there's no morality, that you should go killing people or whatever, that there's no rules. But freedom means ultimately... If you want to do something, you can overcome your nature, you can change, and there's nothing holding you back. You can do whatever you want. In other words, it doesn't mean you can do whatever you want. I can't uh, play professional football tomorrow. I'm not, six, I'm not seven feet tall. But it means morally, I could make my own, I could, I could, make, uh, I could overcome my own instincts. Okay, that's, that's, that's a good point. Again, we can't cover everything. We just want to give a little taste of what uh, uh, I, I uh, you want to give a little taste of what the various perspectives of our Judaism are. Now, we're going to get a little bit more philosophical. What we're going to do now is going to say, with a Hasidic angle, is we're going to say, okay, the Zohar just told you, the Zohar says matzah is the bre bre bread of faith. We'll talk about that. So now we say, what is faith? Oh, so believing that God exists and God gives vitality to the universe, oh, that's not faith. That's, uh, you don't need faith for that. What we're going to say, what the Hasidic angle says, is faith is so much more than that. And that is what we're trying to figure out. And that's what we can internalize when we get to the concept of matzah. So if Tulna was a little bit esoteric and spiritual and a little bit hard to digest, um, we're going to go even further. This may be even more hard to digest, and that would just makes the point that if it's hard to digest it, it means, pun intended, that it's not so easy to do, but if you digest your matzah, pun intended, on the night of Passover, then that helps this awareness enter your, um, and be internalized within the self. So there is um, the concept that it's not so simple necessarily to internalize, and for that you need, for that you need the help of the matzah to help introduce the faith. Okay, so let's think about this question for one second. Let's think about what is the meaning of what is, what, what is the meaning of faith? So the simple definition of faith is okay, I believe that there is a God that creates the universe and gives life to the universe. That's what people think of as faith. Now, what's the nature of this God? What does he know? What does he not know with morality? Does he allow bad things to happen to good people? These are wonderful questions, but we can't cover all the questions today. But again, does God exist? Yes, I believe God exists. Now I'm going to say something very radical. And I'm, I'm, I'm taking the liberty to say it, not because it's my own words. It's the words of Tzemach Tzedek. So if you don't like what he says, um, he said it. All I do, I'm just a mailman, okay? Says the Tzemach Tzedek. Says like this. To believe that there is God that gives energy to the world, that gives life to the world, that's not faith. Why is it not faith? Because that you could see. You could see it with your own eyes. What do I mean you could see it with your own eyes? So I ask you a question. If I say, I believe there's a spiritual force that gives life to my body that I'm calling a soul. That's what I believe. So the Tzemach would say, no, you don't believe you have a soul. You see its function. 
right? You see your heart is pumping. You see um, you're alive. You see life. You see life, you deduce that there's something causing life. Now, again, it doesn't matter the semantics of what you call soul, right? But the concept is that this is something undefined that they still in the laboratory cannot define exactly what life is. They could describe it, but they can't define it. There's some spiritual energy that gives vitality to the human being um, to say, I believe that there's something spiritual, something uh, spiritual, I mean, that is that cannot be tapped by the five senses, right? In other words, there's something that transcends the physical, and that gives life to me. And I'm, I'm going to choose to call that a soul. To say, believe in my soul. I believe I have a soul. It says that some ascetic, you don't need faith for a soul. You don't need faith. You could see it. In other words, you could see its function. Similarly, says that some ascetic, if you're going to say, I look outside, and I see, I'm looking out a window right now, and I see, maybe that's why the lighting is so bad. And I see the tree, and I see growth, and I see life. That's the soul of the world. So to say, I believe there is a soul to the world, which we're going to call God, for that, says the Tzamat Tzedek, for that I don't need faith. You don't need faith to see I have a soul, and you don't need faith to see that the world has a soul. So the conventional definition of faith, there's something creating, something giving energy to the world, according to the Tzamat Tzedek, that is not faith. Why is that? It's like you see it. It's like you see it. You could see it. So what is, it, what is the Jewish definition of faith or the Kabbalistic definition of faith or the Hasidic definition of faith? So now we're going to go so much more. Now what we're going to say is believe that the God that creates the world, the energy that creates the world, in fact, transcends the world. In other words, one perspective would be that there's a God and God creates the world. And that's basically what he does all day. Because what is God? God, you define God as the vitality of the, of the world. Okay, but true faith would be that the life that the 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 energy that gives life to the world doesn't define God. That's only one ray of God compared to something that's infinite. So if you define God as someone who creates the world, it's like defining a great scientist, maybe Albert Einstein, as the author who once upon a time sat in the sandbox and made a sandcastle. Okay, that it's a wonderful thing. He happened to make a sandcastle, but he transcends that definition, right? So, what is faith according to Jew Jewish Jewish Hasidic philosophy? Faith is not what we can see evidence of. Faith is that which we cannot see evidence of. What do you need faith for? To believe that the energy that creates the world is only an external aspect of God, and God Himself is so much more infinite, and to the extent that the world he creates is not really significant compared to his infinity. That is faith. And what do I get from that? What does that do for me? That puts the, into perspective the concept of when I am thinking about my own existence, if I think about the significance of my existence, right? What is God? God creates me, okay? So what is God? What's God's greatness? He creates me. So who's the subject? The subject is the me. So I am the center of the universe. So my existence is the center of the universe. And that's a little problem for humility. But if I say, look, of course God creates the universe, but God is so much more infinite and the universe is insignificant compared to God. So then I look at the physical world and I say, the physical world is not that significant in comparison with the spiritual connection to God because, because God is so much more uh, transcendent than the physical world. So what's meaningful in my life? If, again, let's put it this way. If I believe that God, the definition of God is someone who creates a physical world, creates a beautiful tree and plants it in my garden and gives me a good breakfast, okay? So what do I value? I value a beautiful home with a nice tree in the front and some coffee for breakfast, which is a wonderful thing. But if I have faith, and I, in other words, our definition of faith, understanding that the God that gives energy to the world and gives life to the world is actually transcends the actual giving life to the world, because he is infinite, then what is valuable in my life? Valuable in my life is to connect to the infinity. So the fact that whether I do have breakfast, I don't have breakfast, the breakfast has sugar or doesn't have sugar, these are all very important uh, ideas. But in comparison to my purpose of connection to connecting to God, of connecting to infinity, it becomes much less significant. And that's why we say that the Jewish idea of faith is also has ramifications to my sense of self and my sense of what I value in this world. 
Now, this is very difficult to internalize because what do we know? We know what our senses tell us. So it's hard enough to understand that the life that we see in the world is God. Now you're telling me something much deeper, that the life that we see in this world is only one ray of God, but God himself transcends that, and God himself is infinitely greater than that. That is something that's very difficult to internalize. Now, Judaism, it's, 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 it's really a deep principle in Hasidic philosophy. We say Hashem Echad, God is one. But the Hasidim explain that Hashem Echad means God is the only significant existence. Why is he the only significant existence? Not because the world doesn't exist, but, but because in comparison to God's existence, we are insignificant. And again, that change, what that does is it changes what I value, or how I choose to spend my time, what's meaningful in my life. So what, what's a better day? If I woke up in the morning and I made a dollar, or if I woke up in the morning and I did something transcendent, I helped another person, I had a spiritual moment, I had a spiritual awakening. So again, it depends what my perspective is. If my perspective is self-centered, in other words, physicality-centered, and my definition of God is God who creates the physical world, then the physical world is, 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 is uh, more, more significant in my life. But if my definition of God is God is infinite, and the fact that he creates a world is just one ray of his greatness. And if I have an opportunity to plug into the infinity of God by transcending self and doing a mitzvah, doing a good deed, helping someone else, then that's what I want to do. And then again, that's something difficult to internalize. It's something that the matzah, according to the Hasidic philosophy, helps us, helps us internalize. And we're not going to internalize it fully, but we're going to internalize it a little bit, and as we will, as we will explain. But up till now, because I said so many radical things, and the reason I said so many radical things together is to confuse you. If I only said one radical thing, then you can ask a question. And if I say a series of radical things, then you're not sure what to ask first. So that's my defense. So because I said so many radical things, I'm going to open up the floor for a moment or two. Let's see what people agree or disagree or, or, or protest. And then we will maybe do a little bit more, and then we'll call it a day. Here we go. Don't be shy. Okay, everybody internalize the message. It's wonderful. Everyone have a happy day, and it's good to see you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay, everybody is silent. I'll ask you again a question. Suppose yeah. I have my religion is that God is a small God. There are millions of other more powerful God, gods. Yeah. Does it make me more uh, insignificant and therefore better person. My religion is better because my God is very, very weak. If my God is weak, and here's the thing, yeah, all the pagans, it's very hard, all the pagans felt that their God is weak. What does it mean that God is weak? Some gods were very powerful, but what they all had in, uh, had in common, they could manipulate their gods. So God says, don't murder. Yeah, but if you buy him a, new a nice tuna sandwich, or you buy him a donut and Dunkin' Donuts, if you give him a sacrifice when he's not looking, then when you go and kill someone, he doesn't mind. Okay? So in other words, if, I, if God is small, means I am big. The God is something that's beyond me. The God is something that's beyond me, and if his job, the person that's interacting with me, giving me life, if in some sense, the closer he is to me, the more I manipulate him, the more I'm the center of the universe. The less no, significant... No, my God is very powerful, more powerful than anything, but there are even more powerful gods somewhere else. That's a different problem. The problem of that, um, the problem of that is that there are many. If there are many gods, then it means there are many, there, there are many definitions of what morality is. That's, a, that's, a, that's another whole discussion, but my God says murder is bad, your God says murder is good, and therefore, if you try to choose to murder me, all you need to do is go find protection from, from the God that love, the, the God of war. And therefore, all civilization breaks down. So to have a common morality from the perspective of Judaism, I know some humanists will disagree, but for, for the purpose of this discussion, the, the value of having one God, monotheism, is if there's one God, then there's one morality. If there's one morality, then all people were created in the image of God, and therefore, murder to anybody is wrong. And this but, is but, 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 but you said that God, God, our God created many, many worlds. Maybe in our world to kill somebody is bad, but in all other worlds it's good. So who knows? We don't know. We don't know. But the concept of it is oneness. If there's oneness, if there's pervasive oneness in the universe, right? You're a scientist. The scientists look for, they don't want to say that there are many. Um, they like to say, if I come to a scientist and I'm going to say, look, every world, 
every planet has another set of physics. They don't like that. They don't like those definitions, right? We want, we want, we, we want unifying theories. We like the idea that the same truth, that it's truth that's going to pervade in many, many uh, different uh, var variables as much as possible. The more elegant the solution is, the more one it is. And spiritually, it's the same. If there's one God, there's one truth, then, then to say that it pervades everywhere is actually more um, um, acceptable. Thanks. Okay, if anyone else wants to jump in, now is your chance. Otherwise, we'll do another few minutes about the matzah, and then we'll call it a day. Maybe we'll, con yeah, maybe we'll call it a day. Okay. I think that's a protest. <laughs> okay, the good news is that I'm not going to call on anyone's name. I'm going to continue talking. I'm not going to make you ask any questions. This is a free country. We believe in freedom. The theme of Passover is freedom. We don't, we don't, uh, everybody does what's comfortable. Okay, so let me just put, put, put unmute all and, and, and try to close everything up here. Un unmute all. Okay, let's try, to, let's try to, to, to move on a little bit, just to talk about the function of matzah. There is a fascinating piece of Talmud. I don't know if it's fascinating. I guess it's fascinating. Talmud says like this, the child does not know how to call father until he tastes the taste of grain. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if you tried it at home. Maybe your kid is gluten-free, but... I think what the Talmud is saying is that as long as the, 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 all the child is eating is nursing from his mother, then in the child's world, you only matter if, if you're the mother, right? I have a few children. They don't really look at you until you're five months, the five, six months old. You don't really matter, right? The father, who, what's the father? The mother, oh, the mother they recognize because the mother gives them the food. The moment the child starts eating food that is not the mother, from the mother, oh, this is news. Ah, there's something beyond just my mother. Ah, there's an external universe. Ah, that's a certain maturity that allows it to look beyond its, what, what it's used to, where it's used to looking, sort of expanding its intellectual horizons. And then typically the first thing, the first person it learns to recognize is father. That is what the Talmud seems to be saying about the child does not recognize father. Now he doesn't know who his father is. He doesn't recognize, he doesn't understand. Once a child starts eating grain, oh, then he can recognize his father. Once he expands beyond the mother, he's able to learn that there's a greater universe out there. Right, you stop a kid who's one month old and say, tell me about the universe. They're going to say this. They're going to say, my mother gives me food. That's the definition of the universe. You introduce a little grain. They say, oh, the cereal is here. Oh, there must be a universe. Must be there's a... There's, there's, there's other things that the, the grain has to grow. Of course, we're talking on a metaphorical level. We don't mean the child certainly understands this whole process. But in some sense, the moment this food, the moment the father could start giving food, ah, so the horizons expand. Now, from the Hasidic perspective, everything in the physical world is just an expression of the spiritual reality. And therefore, in the spiritual reality, it's similar. If you look at the... If you look at the reasons for the matzah, so according to the book of education, eating the matzah, the substance of the matzah doesn't really have any um, mystical powers. All it does, it's a reminder, right? You eat the matzah, you remember the story. But what is having the impact on you? The story, it's the idea, not the actual substance of the food. But the mystics believe that the physical and the spiritual are very much connected. And therefore, they believe that the substance of the food is actually has a certain spiritual energy. And they say as follows, going back to the child. Let's analyze for a moment what the child understands and what he doesn't understand. The child understands, once, once he starts eating the grain, he understands that there's something called the father. Does he know what a father is? Does he understand the full depth of what a father is? Could he articulate it to himself? No. But he does have, it's still some degree of knowledge. The child doesn't know how to refer to father until he tastes grain. Once he tastes grain, there's some recognition. Is it the full recognition? Of course not. But there's some degree of recognition. That's when you eat physical bread, you get physical recognition or, or, or recognition of the physical reality. 
if you're going to eat spiritual bread, if you're going to eat the matzah on the night of Passover, the night that it was commanded by God to eat the matzah, then what you're also getting awareness, just like that child whose perspective was limited. And when he ate the grain, the perspective expanded. Similarly, when a person is going to eat the matzah, his spiritual perspective expands. What does he understand? He understands that, that God transcends the, our old idea of God, which is the, the, the being that gives life to the world. No, he starts understanding the infinity of God. There's something so much more beyond what I imagined. Does he fully, under, fully understand it? No, because you could never fully understand it. Because God is infinite and we're finite. But nevertheless, is this the beginning of a process? Could you say there's some recognition? You recognize that something transcends yourself? Yes, it is some degree of recognition. Similarly to the child who eats the bread, on one hand, he gets some recognition of father. On the other hand, he doesn't fully understand the full depth of what it means to be a father. So too, when we eat the matzah, we, get in, we come in contact with the transcendent nature of God. Do we fully internalize it? No, we could never. That's what faith is. Faith is that which is beyond our capacity to understand. But we do have a certain awareness of this, certain infinity, a certain awareness of the transcendent and what's beyond the physical. And hopefully, to summarize, hopefully when we eat the matzah, what that does to us, it expands our spiritual horizon, similar to the child who is only looking at the mother. Not that there's anything wrong with mothers, but it means he's only looking at one perspective and he doesn't, he doesn't open up himself to the rest of the universe. So when, we, when we're in spiritual exile, we're, we're only focused on our self and our sustenance and what's given to us. But when you eat the matzah, it has the capacity to, to, to broaden the spiritual horizon and start thinking about concepts that are, are infinite and ultimately allows us to connect to the infinity of God. And that changes, like I said, it changes. It doesn't leave us unchanged. It, it changes the way we think about reality and most important of what's valuable. And the valuable, the stuff, the physical becomes less valuable and the spiritual becomes much more, um, much more significant and real in our life. So in that sense, I think that will be it for today, but I'm going to open it up. And if anybody wants to ask any questions again,